by asking you, when did you first fall in love with filmmaking? I think, um, good question. Um, I've always loved visual arts and photography. Um, I think the first film randomly that had a massive impact and actually thinking about it had a man massive impact on my career wasn't generally because it was filmic, but it was the content which was born free. I don't know if anyone remembers Joy and um, what's this? Uh, George Adams, wasn't it? In 1966. And actually it was that that just I mean, stuck with me um, for quite a long time. And so that's, that's one of the main films that had a, a massive impact um, on me to begin with and then yeah just became very into um, moving image and telling more storytelling of people's more true stories more real stories less fiction for me just really uh, wanting to give people a voice looking at the underdog kind of thing but in a lot of poetic ways so I think and, where, and where did you learn filmmaking did you learn it formally or did you teach yourself I did, a bit of both really I learned uh, I did a degree, I got um, a first in media studies, but actually that was analog. So I had to relearn. So back then I was learning the old way. So editing was crazy. It took such mm -hmm. a long time because you had to kind of line up the sound with like both the, both the knobs. Like, so a soundtrack that could take five minutes now would literally have taken me off a whole day just to, to actually add that. I did the splicing, the radio splicing with the tape which was amazing. Um, but yeah, so when I came out, it all went digital. So then I had to, I learned editing myself and I was on like video cameras with VHS. We put a massive VHS in and stuff. So yeah, I've had, it's a constant, it's a constant relearning with that. So yeah. Cool. cool. Now, ben, now looking at your CV, I mean, a lot of your filmmaking has been abroad. Not and um, most of it, to be honest, most of it's been abroad. So you're obviously a great traveller. Yeah. And um, you know, one of your earliest sort of filmmaking. I mean, most of your work has has been contract work, or certainly a lot of your you know early sort of filmmaking has been contract. One of your first contracts, I think, was filming in Indonesia. Can you tell us about that. So I started off, um, I think it was in 2003 actually, with a guy called Richard Brock, who was the main producer for um, The Living Planet with David Attenborough. So we started up something called the Brock Initiative, which was looking at ways to um, educate people in local countries with footage that we had the privilege of having. So taking other people's um, footage or donated footage and making new stuff with that footage. So basically what I did in Indonesia, so I went, so generally what it was is we'd go out and live with communities within Indonesia and I'd be more like the tool. So it'd be like working with the local communities and getting their voice across and their ideas. And they would be part of the team. It would be in a local language. Um, so yeah, so the first, one of the first films I ever did was on cyanide and dynamite fishing, which, um, was just huge back then and so people would literally um go down with the cyanide and just um squirt it onto the reef and um, so basically what it would do is stun the fish and then the fish would kind of be a bit stunned it would kill the quarrel obviously and then they would capture the fish and sell it to american markets for tropical fish but bless them, what they didn't know was actually the harm they were doing to themselves. So a lot of the fishermen weren't educated like we are in the Western world. And then they'd obviously, uh, and then they would do like cyanide, like bombing. So they'd literally bomb the reefs up. So again, stunning all the tropical fish, again, for kind of the tropical fish market. So basically what that was when I went out there was just really getting a feel, making them, making them uh, the one in power in a way. So they had the voice to express we're learning from an elder of a tribe, what went wrong, how people had died um, doing this, how it's depleting all their fishing sources. And then what happened with that film was it just went all over Indonesia, all over uh, little fishing villages as an educational thing, but it was a try, it was his voice. So it wasn't, uh, it's so like a Westerner preaching, it was coming from them. So that kind of made it a bit more powerful in that way. So that was- What sort of, you know, what sort of camera setup did you have? What sort of crew just, did you take or any crew? Yeah, to be honest, I've done, in the early days, it was just me and I would work with local NGOs. So just be me and a, I can't remember what camera I had then. Ooh, 
yeah, it was a cannon. Um, but it would be, yeah, just me and I'd just get in touch with local NGOs. So they would do the, the translating. So different NGOs I'd work with, they would take me to all these different places, get the interviews set up. So I'd be always working with a fixer. But generally it was just me and a fixer. Right. So just teams of two for that. Okay. And there was, you said that you, you found out that one of the tribes you you uh, you worked with had a sort of um, rather sort of uh, dark hobby. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, the diet. So when I was, uh, I worked in Indonesia in uh, Borneo, I was doing a, a lot on uh, logging at the time. And so I ended up working with a, a tribe called the Dayak tribe. Um, so, yeah, and I, I didn't really, I'd obviously become friends with these guys. And it was actually a funny story of how I noticed what they did. So we were in the middle of the forest. We were tracking wild orangutans at the time, which was fascinating in itself, um, how they track and use the smell. It was amazing. And we were sat on a log and then one of these guys came up like he was he was kind of got my hand and i was like didn't really understand what he was talking about and wanting to look at my hands so then he goes off and gets this leaf and then starts giving me this little manicure on which was bizarre like, from this leaf like just it was amazing though like to how they kind of use this but when he was doing this i noticed that he had dots up his arm so he had like all these tattoos up his arm and so i asked him what the tattoos were and actually obviously i don't know if anyone knows anything about the diac tribe but that was the number of heads he's actually taken <laughs> on whilst i was alone in the jungle with him <laughs> giving myself like a little manicure so yeah that was it, it, it because you know even back then that was in the early like uh, early 2000s but we weren't taught i didn't know like we, again that was very sheltered with the internet we didn't have as much knowledge uh, there was still going on that kind of warfare, tribal warfare, where they would take people's heads and put them on poles. And that was like less than 20 years ago. So it, it was, well, yeah, 15. So, but just fascinating in, in that way. Right. <laughs> so was it reassuring that you were with one of the tough ones or scary? Yeah. It wasn't what I was obviously expecting. I mean, they're lovely. We're just, they were my friends and I just didn't, it was just like, oh, they're interesting, you know, just why have we got so many dots? And then also when I started looking at everyone's wrists, <laughs> so woohoo. Exactly. Well, we, we will be looking out for that in the future. Yeah. Okay. And um, you said part of that trip, um, you were taken on a quad bike, I think. So uh, had, that was, yeah. no, that, that was actually in Europe. I was ah, at the, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that was a different. I can. Okay, so 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 the Indonesian trip. So you'd finished the you finished the film, and it was successfully by by circulating it locally. Hopefully, it got changed behavior. You mm. think is that the idea? Uh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I still get uh, messages from the scientists now, and he still uses that film. He he still says it's one of the most powerful films he's ever had because of the way it wasn't made for a Western audience in that way. It wasn't. It still had that kind of, you know, sharpness or whatever, but it had in mind for for the local people. Um, right. And so he still uses it, but then he also uses it, uh, he, he told me actually last year, he still takes it to UN meetings and, you know, it still, it still happens. It doesn't happen quite so much now. Um, so people have become wise to it because it's just ignorance. It's not that they're stupid. It was just they were told this is the best way and the fastest way to to fish and so that's what they did but they were becoming severely ill and they yeah. were dying and and obviously they didn't have they depleted their own fish stock so yeah yeah, yeah. okay cool and then so and then um you came back and there was this this incident with the quad bike and the uh his pet your large yellow pet Wow, cello pet. No, so the, the quad bike, that was just, that was, so basically what happens on a job if we, if I, on this one, this was more of an investigation job. Right. So quite, what happens on investigations quite often, I mean, you have a plan, you can do as much research as you possibly can, but quite often what happens is it's kind of word of mouth and who you get to and then you get contacts and that's basically journalism. Um, and this particular time, which was uh, quite interesting, the guy that I um, had found who was a source who could have taken me somewhere uh, deep into the, the forest uh, was this one-eyed, quite aggressive 
looking guy, but he seemed quite nice, quite personable. And um, and that's and this is what we do in my job. So off I go in onto the quad bike. And it was just the craziest. He went so fast. It was just the most ridiculous kind of I he only slowed down when I started talking to him. So I started talking a lot because it was quite scary. <laughs> so we're like going down and up and then so because every time like I spoke, he took his foot off the accelerator because he couldn't quite hear me. So that was my trick just to like talk all the time. And then before we got to where we were going, I mean, obviously, I, I'm used to asking a lot of questions. So, and I asked him what happened to his eye, just thinking nothing much really. And he um, basically what happened was he literally just come out of uh, jail for manslaughter. And um, yeah, <laughs> I was just like, all right, wonderful. And he goes, uh, yeah, so basically that that was the guy that, that took his eye. So that that was lovely. Um, the other guy obviously came unnerved. off. The other guy came off worse, though. The other guy did come <laughs> lot, off a lot worse as I sat there having a sandwich. Um, yeah, so that was uh, interesting. <laughs> what about, and there was, you said that you were interviewing this other chap and he had a rather unusual pet. I mean, uh, yeah. I think, I so, think animals are going to go right the way through this talk for it, so, so we'll have, to, that, we'll have to have a little list. So I hope everyone likes uh, I mean, I'm a massive animal lover, that was my thing, and I think going back to that film, which I hadn't actually realised, like Born Free, uh, that's a massive passion of mine, I can't stand anything being caged, it's just massively, you know, even myself, I like to be free, I travel, I'm very independent, I do a lot of things, so seeing things in cages is... So, I mean, a lot of, I've done a lot of stuff on the wildlife trade or, or globally, um, a lot of investigations, but one of the ones was, um, yeah, he, um, I was interviewing someone who had a rather large uh, python, huge python. And whilst I was interviewing him, he decided to let the python out of the, of his lovely little box. And it was absolutely huge. And it starts to kind of go up my leg and then go round. And that, yeah, so it was quite terrifying, but he didn't, he didn't seem to quite like me that much. I don't know, he just, he decided to put him, to put him back, but he, this snake would like, would have lunch and then the snake would just be going up the wall or then decide to take himself into his bedroom and then curl up onto the bed. But it's quite unnerving when you've got like a, a humongous snake and you're trying to quite obviously conduct an interview and keep calm keep you know present and so yeah that those kind of things happen happen a lot actually <laughs> and you're and you're obviously using a cat are you are you using a cam on a tripod handheld yeah yeah i'm using this is yeah. what i've been using it's a c100 so that's what i use but yeah so it was on a tripod and you use, and you record the audio straight into the camera will you uh with that one i was probably uh with a lapel mic to be honest he was okay. quite an important interview Right. But yeah, I mean, obviously the snake kind of added into it when for shots and stuff. But uh, yeah. And do you rely on sort of natural lighting, or do you try and have some additional lighting, or? Because of the, depending on what style. I mean, this is like oh, investigation natural. You, you can't. You haven't got time really. You really have to deal with natural lighting uh, yeah. unless we're going. We're making a documentary, and obviously you're you're interviewing a, a government minister or something that's more set up. Then you have the time. To, to to take the lights in, but no, not not necessarily natural lighting all the way. You just haven't got the time. And are you sort I, of, and I mean, I guess in the early days you wouldn't have been up uploading to the cloud or sending it back. You would have just been holding on to the the hard drive and the discs. And yeah, yeah, well, the tape, yeah, tape, the little little tapes, duct tapes yeah. we had then. Yeah. Oh, right. Cool. Now, continuing the animal theme, you told me something about something to do with hippos. Um, they do this very peculiar thing that you managed uh, to capture that no one's captured before. Well, no, I did, yeah, I nearly captured. Nearly, I ca nearly captured. So I was uh, working with um, WWF in Gabon in Africa, uh, which was amazing because it's just, it just, at the time there's hardly any infrastructure, it's like one main road. So everywhere we traveled was just via like going across savannas and rivers and no main roads. Um, but at that particular time where I was working, I hadn't seen as many animals as I perhaps wanted to. And although I suppose I shouldn't have potentially gone out on my own, because they advised me not to, I had been there a little while and I thought I'd go for a little five o'clock, six o'clock morning walk. Um, 
And so, yeah, and, and basically what happens over there, because I'd heard that there's only on, on the coast, um, hippos are known to surf in the sea. And so I thought, well, you know, what are my chances? That's not going to happen. So they actually um, leave their normal habitat yeah. and go out along the beach. They go, oh, yeah, 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 they come onto the beach. Yeah. And there, there was only, at the time, I don't know now, but there was only three people in the world that had this footage of like hippos surfing. Um, so yeah, so I decided to pop out that morning and um, lo and behold, I mean, it was quite scary. I mean, like hippos are the most dangerous animals out there, to yeah. be honest. Like it's ridiculous. I don't know. I think once, uh, for some reason, not so much now, but when I was younger, I used to go out and I just felt really, I don't know, randomly safe, but which is ridiculous because I, don't, I just, so I wandered down and this amazing, it was an amazing stretch of beach where you had the, um, the rainforest with the lagoon. So you had the fresh water, then you had like this stretch of like sand and then the sea. And there was three hippopotamuses um, just there. And I got super excited, but luckily I was downwind. So if they obviously can get, if they can smell you, you're in danger. You're in a lot of danger. So I, um, yeah, found this, it's ridiculous, found this really tiny log that I hid behind, which I didn't really hide behind, and just waited uh, for these hippos to um, surf. But unfortunately at that time, and I was there for about, I don't know, 40 minutes or whatever. Obviously doing wild wildlife films, you have to stay there a long time. But as they were gradually creeping closer to me, I just got a little bit more afraid, not having a guide, you know, just on my own as you do. And then I noticed that there was a crocodile. This is the thing. There's a crocodile running around the other side on the salt on the on the lagoon side. So I'm lying there, and this crocodile just jumps. Runs, runs into the water and then just starts circling. And I'm still, for some bizarre reason, more interested in trying to get this shot of these hippopotamus. So at that particular time, I'm literally probably in the most endangered environment there ever is. So I, got, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, but for some reason, yeah. So, and then I decided potentially after an hour and I was watching out of my eye, like this crocodile that was just circling. And I was just lying there like bait. Um, now potentially, I should potentially, you know, look after my life and they haven't gone surfing. I wasn't gonna get the shot. I got some lovely shots of them on the beach going towards the sea and that I should probably literally run back. So <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> but it was the most amazing experience, like having to live yeah. together. Just like being that close to nature, like it was beyond words, just that whole, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Wow, wow, yeah. fantastic. And then um, other, other animals have come along, sea lions and giraffe. Do you want to talk about this? No? Uh, so I was working with um, Leicester University in Kenya and Tanzania. And so what I was doing there was training environmentalists, so young adults who are already in the kind of uh, conservation or environmental area to uh, make films. And again, that was amazing. So they would literally come for two weeks and we would make the films and then take those on a road show to local people, but they'd all made them themselves. So they were quite powerful. But where we were, um, where we were situated, where there was a camp, it was right on Lake Navasha, which was amazing. Um, so we had our camp and then we could just walk through and yeah, I used to, um, go for my daily walk with the, with the wild animals, which was mad. I think the first time it didn't quite hit me again. So because we were kind of just taken, we were told that we can just go down to the lake and I'm still from, you know, the UK. I haven't really had much African experience. And then, um, so I thought, okay, like, a watering, I thought, like almost a watering hole, is it? For yeah. Right. So the first time I decided to walk on my own, because everyone said that's fine, literally the first thing that happened was like there's a herd of wildebeest. <laughs> so I'm literally going, I've been told this is fine, so this is fine. So I'm literally just walking through like this herd of wildebeest towards the water, which was, you know, scary enough. And then there was this... About, um, there was this giraffe and what was lovely about this giraffe um so again i had my camera i was just out i was taking other shots for the films but also for myself so i could use for other stuff 
And I just started to bond with this giraffe, which would end up like quite often when I went down there, just following me back to, to the camp, which was rather lovely. So yeah, so there's a, there is a lot of animal stories, but um, that, was, that was amazing. So I just ended up filming. And what would happen was I, when, it, when it first happened, I turned around and walked and then I could feel it kind of like, <laughs> and then it would stop and I was like, no, that's not happening. And then I'd walk again and then I'd walk again. And then like, like a sort of Pixar yeah. movie. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. But, yeah. If you've, I don't know if you've got any images or videos we can share later or the like, yeah, on your website. Yeah, I can find. Oh, oh, that's old. It's quite old, but yeah, I can find some stuff. Cool. And the sea lions, were they? Well, that was, that was, you were swam yeah. with sea lions. What's that like? So that was, I was working in the Galapagos. I was living there for a couple of months. And again, that was, um, had a day off so in the Galapagos again I was working with a lot of NGOs um either making conservation films or uh, their pop videos that I I set up a charity doing that but this particular day was my day off and so I went out on a boat and just took my snorkel and as I was swimming out um yeah it was, it, this is probably one of the most magical experiences I've ever had to be quite honest the sea lion was coming towards me and as it was coming towards me, I just kind of, it, it, it was just, it started to blow bubbles. It was like it was playing chicken. For some reason, again, I wasn't that fearful. I just, I, I love being out in nature. And so what it would do, it would come towards me, like, and then it would flip and like swim under me and then blow a bubble in my face. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and you and dolphins really did that. I didn't know sea lions did that. Yeah. Literally, and it kept, and I was like, no, that didn't happen. So I kept on swimming, and then it would come at me again. And then it would literally just go, and then go, and it was the most amazing. So I spent, and then I would just like, it was, it was mad. So I just started laughing, like really, really laughing and just playing. And we would just, um, I would like dive down, and then we'd just like tumble around. It was, it was beyond incredible than this other, uh, seal came along and did the same thing and it, it was literally the most magical experience and then a load of a group of tourists came along and scared them and they shot off and that was the thing but for me I sat on the beach and I was like that actually happened and then this couple came and sat next to me and they just said I'm really like just have to tell you that we were swimming and we've just been watching you for 20 minutes that's just the most amazing thing we've ever seen like just that whole interaction, that whole uh, amazingness with the with the sea lions. So yeah, it was yeah, it was. I suppose I love nature, although I live right in the city centre, as about as mm, in the city centre as you can get in Bristol. But... <laughs> well, it makes it special when you yeah. go to these places, doesn't it? It's brilliant. That's an amazing experience. I've never heard of anything like that. Oh, uh, there it was. It's still yeah. It was just yeah, so, it's funny. Well, I was, was just laughing, you know, yeah, that yeah, kind of thing, sounds... and you could really feel it, and you could. It was so cheeky. It was just like, and they would wait until just, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a Netflix video that's just come out about this chap who spends, who decides to go every day into the sea to meet with an octopus. Yeah, to, my, well, I've seen that. It's Amazing. Good. It's incredible. Oh. And you had some interesting experience with a orangutan as well. I think you taught them how I to brush their teeth, did you? <laughs> what was that? So you, Teach your orangutan how to brush your teeth. So, no, I was working in um, in Kalimantan in Borneo, so I was living in in the in the depths of the jungle. So there's like five hours from any any kind of civilization, and there's ex captive orangutans there. So basically, what we did, in the, it, so we would go to the it was the most incredible jetty, um, like this two hundred meter jetty out into the river. Um, so we used to go and clean our teeth there or, or wash there in the morning. And one particular morning, I think I, uh, yeah, I was just there cleaning my teeth. And what happened was the um, Pan, who's the juvenile and uh, the mum came along. So the juveniles normally stay with their mums for about eight, but he was really, really cheeky. And they're all quite cheeky. So I was sat there and I've been there a while. So I'd kind of got to know them. They are ex-captives. So these aren't wild orangutans. And um, and so I sat there and had my bottle of water and then cleaning my teeth and they both went like this. And I was like, really? So I poured the water into their mouths, like, 
and they did they just copied so we were all mm -hmm. sat there I was like cleaning my teeth and then like and then spats and so they would like just mimic what I was doing and then just all spit so yeah one of the many stories of there but I could go on forever for that wow. <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> orangutans that's are another amazing. most incredible incredible creatures cool. Love them. And then we promised everybody we were gonna we were gonna teach them some tiger. <laughs> I didn't. You, can you remember any of your tiger? I remember. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was on an investigation. So that wasn't that wasn't too happy. So I was dealing with a lot of unhappy tigers, unfortunately. So um, I, that was an undercover investigation that I was doing. But one of the one of the the nice things that I did. Well, I tried out was, I was taught how to say hello in Tiger, um, which I didn't quite think I could do until I was sat in a cage and for the first time thought I would try it out. And there was this tiger, I mean, it was only like a mesh cage thing. And there was a tiger next to me. And so I tried it out and it answered. It was amazing. It was just the very, and so it was like, just, it was, it was incredible. So I had this tiger like, I can't even remember how to make the noise. You really don't want me to do it, do you? Um, <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. No, like, oh, really? Go on, we need to learn these things. Oh, oh Casey. Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> it was kind of more like a monkey. It was, it was like a... <laughs> it was kind of from the back of the throat. It was oh. mad. And so then I said hello to all the loads of tigers that were there and, and actually got a response. And that was the most, in, in, again, one of the most, I mean, these are captive and it was horrendous. So, you know, imagining they were free and somewhere nice, but it was amazing connection to, to have. So that was great. I mean, that sounds like a good opportunity to talk about then about some of the, because it sounds like this was an undercover, undercover piece. And this was trying to obviously expose you know, sort of bad practice or, you know, similar to the sort of fishing, you know, the fishing, fishing um, contracts, you know, the fishing, the Sinai fishing, yeah. you know, so, I mean, what sort of, obviously that's, that comes back to the born free, doesn't it? That sort of sense of, you know, trying to expose, you know, sort of harm to animals or harm, you know, harm more generally. And so with the tiger thing, so that was, again, that was undercover, so you had to use covert techniques. Mm -hmm. You say something, maybe that's quite interesting, how do you, because obviously when we go filming, <laughs> you know, we'll go onto Bedminster High Street and everyone will see us, you know, so how do you, you know, can you tell us something about how do you film and not be seen? Yeah, I mean, I, I got into investigations by accident, really. Um, via all this other stuff that I did and then came across a company called Eco storm, um, and yeah, completely by accident. But I've been doing uh, undercover work for God, fifteen years now. Um, hardcore wasn't the happy stuff. Uh, mental health wise, not that great. But yeah, so we would have a, a selection of different cameras that we would use um, from. So we'd have like bag cameras to we'd use glasses, we'd use pens, we would use um, like in the portfolio. And I have I have got a little one, I and mean, this is ancient, but I have got one here that I can show you. This is the one that I probably used. So what it does, so what you generally do is just this little model here. Okay. And this is um, so this would be the spy. Bit. And for this, for example, when I was working with um, animals or had to have my hands, and what you would do is you would get like a bag. Uh, generally, you need to have like a hard shelled bag because if you have soft bags, like obviously, the thing is with covert filming, as you know, you filming, you film with your eyes, but suddenly you have to put your eyes wherever that camera is. Okay. So it's like a whole different skill that you, you have to learn. So you kind of you're thinking of different angles all the time. Um, so yeah, with this one, I mean, they're much more sophisticated now, but this one, for example, all I would do was just here. So this is like a bum bag. And then you would place like the, the, the camera into a little hole. And what the camera, I haven't got any to, to show you, unfortunately, but what, what they come with is like buttons. So you get like a little button 
or this one had like a little metal screw that went with the with here and then you would just uh, then you just screw in the um, button and then place obviously the the camera in the bag and what I would generally do is surround it with things that people don't want to look at like tampons to be honest but like so it like it's dangerous work yeah, yeah. you know like it's really dangerous and so you'd have to you know so I'd fill up the other stuff with hand stuff on this that and the other and then put that there so that's generally what you do and then you well, and I kind of sewed in a little compartment because obviously it does have a light which we don't want either and these are the kind of downfall with these things but uh, so again, like we use these in shirts. So you do the same thing. Um, you would just put it in your shirt button. And then with this, because it's really, I mean, obviously you can, black shirts are obviously the best. So then we just literally tape it all the way down. And then um, we'd have like a back pocket kind of elastic band thing. And then you just place that in, in the back, like so. And again, so you have to, it's just quite your eyes are where the bag is. So if you're interviewing someone, you have to like learn where that is because otherwise you, you get completely the wrong kind of shots. I mean, a lot of the time it's the audio that you potentially are looking for kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so we had different kind of uh, different equipment, uh, glasses, the glasses are obviously a lot better, but one of my glasses, it comes with a really great thing when it fill, you know, so basically when it's full, it flashes. <laughs> I mean, my God, I was on an investigation and literally, thank God, didn't swear. Amazing. Um, yeah, so you wear the glasses, the glasses are great, obviously, because you've got the eye line. And I was with the team anyway, and I turned around and I was like, and I could see, and I was like, oh my God. And this blue light was just, just flashing. I mean, how? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a slight design fault if it's a, if you're actually meant to have a hidden camera in some glasses, but right there, just it flashes that you're yeah. So um, that wasn't good. But you have like uh, pens and watches and all sorts of things. And how easy was it to get into these places in the first place? Obviously, you presume you had to sort of charm uh, your way in or cheat your way in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, different personas, undercover, that, that kind of thing, doorstepping, long. I only did a few ones that were more, prefer doorstopping, um, longer term, but again. What do you yeah. mean by doorstopping? The doorstopping is um, where well, you just turn up. Oh. So people aren't expecting you. So you just, other ones obviously have to be arranged with a different kind of, identities or whatever but yeah so it's um it's interesting it's hardcore hence why uh having a little well probably retired now don't be yeah. doing any more of that so. yeah yeah and what's interesting i think with my personality as well like i'm a very much a truthful person it's like uh, truth is very important to me and but with this job you had to lie, which goes against every cell in my body, yeah. you know, to but get you're the doing, truth. But you're trying to do that to expose the truth. Yeah, but yeah. for me, as a because a lot of the time, it, uh, people are amazing. Not all, but that's mm. the thing. It, it's it's such a crazy world when people are doing things to survive or whatever, and it has to be in context, you know? It has to be in context, so, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and so that sort of passion for you know, sort of exposing, you know, exposing um, bad practice. I suppose, you know, we saw that with the video that we shared to the group, hopefully most have seen it, Farmageddon. Again, that was, again, to do with animals, but more, but this is more to do with rather than, I guess maybe the tigers was keeping them as pets. This is more about factory farming and factory farms. Um, can you talk a bit about that project? So add context to the film we, sh we shared. I mean, I think the thing with factory farming, yeah, I mean, animals is just a small percentage of it. It's the overall huge destruction of the planet. So it just, if you're not into animals, it affects, it will affect something in your life. So even if you eat meat, it's the, it's the standard of the meat you're eating. Um, it's just the complete, the logging, the, the pollution, the disregard for local communities and their health. It's just complete devastation on such a large, large scale. So 
again, I'm not against farming. I'm just, it's against factory farming. It's really like trying to put a stop to factory farming because on, on every level, it's just wrong. So whether you're into animals or not, it's not really about that. It's the quality of the food that you're actually getting. It's the actual destruction of the rainforest or the surrounding areas, you know, the slurries that go out into, especially in America, massive slurries. They go out into the water, the poisoning, the rivers, you know, the wildlife is all dead. The, the rivers have nothing left. So it's, yeah, it's, I mean, factory farming for me is actually a huge, not sort of passion. In my lifetime, if there's one thing I'd want to see would be the end of factory farming. And that is a huge, without a doubt, definitely for me. So, and all that filming was, was with this Philip Lumbery. Did you go yeah. to all those locations? Not all of them, just no, some of them. Okay. So there's a few of our filmmakers that okay. that go out and, and do and, and do that. So yeah. But it's the same, same, yeah, kind of thing that we, we do. Um and door stopping and all sorts of interesting, interesting things. But yes. I mean, do you have time to sort of re reshoot, retake? No. You know, somebody sort of you ask something, you ask somebody something, and they say they stumble over their words. Can you ask them again, or does it feel too? It, depending on it, I mean, there's a, such a lot of a raw, there's such a lot of raw emotions around this as well. When you're interviewing people, a lot of people have committed suicide. There's murders that it's it's really quite hardcore. So if you're interviewing people about the devastation of their livelihood. You can do, you can. If, again, for me, it's quite hard because depending on I have a translator, I have a fixer, oh. so I don't speak the language. So what's really hard for me is, is not knowing what they've said. Right. So unfortunately I'm asking the question in English and I'm not quite sure how they've answered it back. Oh. And they, the, the fixer will kind of tell us at that time and you're thinking, okay, that's good. Like, how do I rearrange that or do whatever? But um, so yeah, so basically, and then it's when you get back and then you get the whole transcript like translated and then obviously I edit it as well. So then you sit down and then you kind of try and figure it out from that, from the subtitles. I mean, sometimes you can twist the subtitles a little bit, you know, just for the English viewer, wow. just, to, just to make it that little bit more impactful. But yeah, it's it's heartbreaking because the, the, the most powerful shorts and also what's, what's hard with the job is these people look at you as if you're going to save them and that's quite a lot especially when nothing happens you know so I've been to a lot of places and they really it's quite it feels like quite a lot of responsibility that they really think that what you're doing you know and you hope something will happen but quite often mass corporation wins money wins so that's the thing really it's quite hard to um and sometimes I've made films and they haven't even gone out because they're too scared. So, and you've gone out on the field and you've made it and you've kind of promised these people you'd help them and then they sat on a shelf. So there's a lot of, it's hard. It, it's really, really hard. So, yeah. You have to get each of them to sign disclaimers? No, or... not these, not, not in the countries that we've gone right. to because that doesn't even really exist in, in that, over there. So, and they just want, they're like, well, they just want to live. They just want anything. It's so um, quite hardcore, the circumstances that they've, they've been in or they're scared. I mean, they obviously if they're scared, then they would won't talk to camera and stuff. But yeah, mm. so, you know, factory farming sounds boring, but it literally, it's not the animals. It's literally the whole ecosystem. Well, ourselves that are being destroyed and livelihoods and, and stuff. So that's why it's kind of a big, big thing for me. And, and is it and it, and how has it changed you? You know those experiences. Uh, a lot. Uh, I mean, I I I used to be a meat eater. I don't eat meat again. I'm not preaching because I'm not against that. It's about having local. There's amazing farmers out there. There's amazing farmers that love wildlife, that love their their cows, their pigs, their chickens, or whatever. Um, yeah, it's changed me a lot because I know too much. No, like, yeah, so unfortunately, you, know, you can't unsee what you see. And it's hard to put that across in a film. It's hard to preach because people don't want to know, but it's not even, yeah, it's, it, it's quite bad. It is quite bad. And, it, and hopefully 
things are turning. I mean, David Attenborough is eventually, I mean, I love him, don't get me wrong, but um, he's actually put this one out and shown the importance of, of what we eat and stuff. Um, and all having our little bit of responsibility. But yeah, it's uh, it's tough when you see, see so much. And I think the thing with my traveling is I always get taken to the shit places. <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? It's not that, it's not, I mean, so I, I find it quite hard to travel now because I always want to want to go like, where's it happening? You know, I'm not like, oh, everything's happy. And what, so generally I get picked up at the airport and then taken to somewhere. Right not that great or then get told this and then that and then you're always looking for I mean don't get me wrong there's amazing stuff out there as well but I think that's why I've stepped away I haven't really well stepped away ish um because sometimes you can get so in it and not see the other side it it gets quite quite hard but there's mass there is mass change the, I mean like the vegan movement or whatever or just organic farming I, and the youngsters are amazing they're, they're just much more knowledgeable so yeah and it's for them at the end of the day it's them and their kids that that are gonna see it or not see it yeah yeah so you're positive about you're positive about things even though you've seen ah, a lot of bad but things. you have to be really yeah. <laughs> definitely you have to be definitely I, i've seen a lot of change over the last 20 years it's a, but then I've seen a lot, a lot of destruction i mean when i first started diving and underwater diving and filming Amazing. In the last 20 years, it's hardly anything left. But anyway, something yeah, happy yeah. we can talk about. <laughs> well, why don't we talk, you said about diving. What about the underwater videos you made in uh, Malaysia? Yeah, I mean, they were nice. That, that wasn't, that was just, I was training in Sipper Dam because I, uh, I wanted to be a potentially an underwater camera operator. Um, so I spent uh in Sipa it was amazing um spent a, a few weeks out on an island just learning to film underwater which was absolutely incredible out there so, so for the techies can you tell us a little bit about okay, how yeah. you do that I mean, generally yeah I mean you have all the different filters because obviously the color of the water either red or green um can't really remember so long ago I'm going back to quite a long time ago probably about 15 years but we had our under housing uh, camera it's no different really it's just the filters that were different you just had the housing and just make sure that that was all right I mean it's your diving that needs to be good you know to get those kind of um, shots um, so we just rest and obviously you're not supposed to touch the coral so you'd be kind of you know balancing with one arm and then getting the shots with one other arm but there's amazing like I had turtle in the sun shots or just swimming through shoals of fish and manta rays, sharks, yeah. But again, it's feeling at one with nature. Like when you feel comfortable in the environment, it's generally easy, easy to, to kind of get those shots. But all it, all it was was just, I can't even remember what camera it was. It was a small one, a Sony something or other, in a, yeah, housing and then putting the correct filter on. And that was it really. Sarah, do you still do diving? Mm -hmm. I haven't for a while, but I would love to get back into it. I yeah, I was doing more investigation, more so wasn't really on the trips where I was working um, with the local people. I just only had more time, but haven't done, haven't unfortunately. Want to get back into? Do you dive? No. Um. <laughs> do, you, do you dive in England? Or just a uh, I have done, yeah, it's cold, cold, but then cold. I've got, well, yeah, it's amazing, but I've just got into cold water swimming, so we'll be all right with it. <laughs> well, you won't get Alzheimer's, that's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, uh, Peter Frost, Surrey Hi, Borders. Peter. Hi. Um, Sarah. Uh, have you got any photographic record of these exciting adventures you've had, or are you were you rather more concerned about escaping from them eventually <laughs> in your life uh, rather than taking photographs? Uh, do you know what? It was funny because, like, having doing this talk, I was thinking back, and I I do somewhere. They're all. It would depend what was used for the film. So, like with the hippos, I do have that, but it was never used anywhere. So it's all it's all on tapes or or on hard drives. Um, yeah, 
I have, I do have a lot of photos, but again, these particular times, no, unfortunately, the ones I've mentioned, not really, but I would have pictures of Lake Navasha. I've got the films that all the guys made. Yeah. So I would have record of it somewhere on a hard drive. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But not those moments. And in a way, what's interesting, it's quite funny. I find when I, because I spend so much time behind a camera, those, I really remember those moments when there's not a camera. I mean, I know the hippo one was there, but just it's quite nice sometimes that whole interaction without the camera has kind of, has been amazing. But, and the tigers and, well, although I had a hidden camera. <laughs> yeah, I do need to document a lot of it. It's all uh, archived somewhere. Yeah, you've got the stories. I think you could write a book about this really and truly, you know? Yeah, but yeah. You need the pics. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I do have pics. I do have pics somewhere, I do. I mean, the thing is with him, um, but that's what's like quite funny because I was thinking I do need to find all these kind of images. And, and what is quite nice, I have, I think they're in the attic somewhere, but they're taped. So I'm, I was actually thinking I'm going to get myself a little DAP machine. Do you remember those little? Yeah, yeah and actually transfer those and um, get everything in order. I think I'm just, you know, when you're just busy, I haven't even really thought about it because you get on to the next job and then the next job and the next job and the next job and the next job and then you're like, and it was only today, I was like, I really must, these are amazing, you know, I'd love, I'd, and I was actually thinking, where's my hippo footage? I'd love to see my hippo footage and, <laughs> and all, you know, not potentially the tiger ones, but um, yeah, no, I do definitely, they are there. I hope they're still there. Great, thanks. <laughs> Gonna, you're going to have to transfer a lot of your old footage now into digital, aren't you? I That's know. Trouble. We all got that I, problem. You have. I know. But at least hopefully it's all still there. Slightly worried now. <laughs> did you say Did you say you use a DAT player? You know, one of those, that's how we used to just, is it one of those tapes? Yeah. So you just. Yeah, because they're really difficult to get hold of DAT players. Oh, really? Because they only do audio, don't they? Or did you? Did it do film no, they did like yeah. So they did a little video, and then you we literally put those machines into the back of the computers, and that's how we transferred them. But I think I'm going to get on the case now. I do. I need to rest <laughs> all my images before it fades from my actual memory. <laughs> yeah, because um, we used to record. I'll tell you, like musician years ago, we recorded all our masters onto digital audio tape, DAT, DAT tape, we, yeah. we call it DAT. But yeah. you just cannot get DAT players no more and I can't play nothing. Oh, God. don't <laughs> say really that. Difficult. Yeah, I borrowed That's one from be... a friend and I managed to take, well, remaster probably like 30 or 40 tracks, but there's about another 10, 15, the DAT player broke and that, mm. was that it broke halfway through. So it was really difficult to get all the DAT players. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Well, there's a will, there's a way, I'll get one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, after this, I'll be there, I'll be in my attic, I'll be like, oh, what is <laughs> Panic. It'll be on eBay. <laughs> Brian, yeah, Brian had a question. Yes, please. Um, how do you edit when you're in such a location, please? Uh, on an investigation, we don't edit, so we just put it all on to about 10 hard drives, just so we all have a different hard drive. Um, but when I was out in Gabon, and I had just had a little Mac laptop, that I would edit on, uh, Premiere Pro, or actually probably Final Cut Pro, I was editing on then. So I was just editing on laptops. And there. what happens to the footage after you've edited? When you're... No, depending abroad? on, um, again, depending what company. So we work for all the main charities, uh, such as Greenpeace, Whisper, Amnesty. So you get hired by different clients or whatever, and then it's up to them what they do. Uh, if it's for a certain NGO, I just hand the film over because that's when I stop. That's, you know, they just, it's up to them to, to then distribute it. Um, so the college's film unit, that was me for quite a long time. So a lot of their films went up. Uh, Guardian News, a lot of it went on Guardian Independent, um, BBC. So that was kind of the different channels, HBO, Green TV. It just depends who I'm working for, really. And then they would distribute it. But that was kind of when I stopped and went on to another project and left that behind, so. Okay, thank mm. you. 
So we'll look, any other questions? Oh, Philip has one, go for it, Philip. Uh, I'll just say, would these uh, companies that you work for, would they have the copyright of it? Or yeah. could you copy for yourself? Uh, no, they would. They own the copyright. That's the, that's the things I'd have to get permission if I wanted to release yeah. or, or show something because they own the material. Unless, apart from Gabon, because that that's mine. Those hippos are mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff. It's owned by them and copyrighted by them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say I'm going to share the um, the link for the Ralph Steadman video to people. And then we're going to have uh, about a 15 minute break. This was um, to do with homelessness, actually. So a, a Ralph Steadman, I'm sure, hopefully, well, you all know. And it was just a beautiful little piece of him. Um, so he was painting a piece um, to auction to raise money for charity. So that's what it is. Really. Yeah. OK. OK. All right. So we'll see you back in about 15 minutes. There is one photo. <laughs> that's me with the, the jetty that I was talking about, the orangutan. Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and is it again? Is it is is the orangutan mimicking you, or is it are you mimicking it? Just I was <laughs> lying down. It just came and lied down next to me, so you can see. Um... Yeah. Wow. So that's the jetty I was talking about, where. I was like, oh, I do have one to hand. It's just on the wall. That's what you heard me clattering and banging away. <laughs> so that was just working with Big Issue, actually. Um, if you wanted to know. So that was a piece, again, working with another charity, but they're all just really different. Um, amazing guy. That um, He was doing that piece to auction off and to raise money for the homeless. So that was what that little video was about. But the interesting thing about that video, um, which was really special for me, is that no one knew he made music prior to that. He hasn't told anyone. Um, and I suppose that, um, as I was saying to Bella now, but I suppose the thing about being a filmmaker sometimes is when you make people feel really comfortable with you, they, they tell you stuff because they forget the camera's not there and that's the skill of that incident really was he just wanted to show me this uh, record that, that he made. And that just made the piece in my head. I was like, oh my God, the man that woke up in the dark, I can't even believe you haven't connected that. And the fact that he started singing it and the fact that he made it was just incredible. Um, and his daughter was uh, in the room as well, um, was so blown away that she was crying because I don't think she'd ever, you know, it was just, it, it was amazing. She just got really emotional about the piece and the fact that he was singing. And and I suppose that's the thing with, again, with that one, that was all natural lighting. And with natural light, you have to just be quick to, to catch, catch what's going on. I didn't know he was gonna do that. We'd finished kind of the whole kind of chit chat thing, but actually that piece made it, you know, that if you hadn't of sung the man that, that well, I didn't even know he'd made that years ago, but if he hadn't have sung that, yeah, that piece would have taken a whole different feel. I would have edited it completely differently. But actually, it was amazing. Um, so it was just really quite special. So he'd actually, he'd actually recorded a record, made a record. Yeah, he's recorded a couple of track. Well, he's actually recorded quite a few. He was playing them all to me, which was lovely. Um, but he never, yeah, never told anyone or let that out. So that was the first time it'd been aired. It was hilarious. So in that, that way. So it wasn't like a recording contract where they were expecting him to sort of go on tour. He just had yeah. them made for himself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's made, he made quite a few. He made quite a few. And that because the other one as well, um, right at the start, that was another one of his. Uh, so at the start of the movie, that's another one of his records. So mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, started and ended it with it. What was that filmed with, please? Uh, what was it? it was a C, with this one, it was a C100. This one. This little one. Can I ask a question? Upgrade. Go on, David. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, with filming interviews, it's, it's quite personal, isn't it? So you've got to got, gain their confidence and get them to sort of open up a little bit. Do you have to spend a lot of time with him beforehand or was he naturally confident? And did you keep the camera rolling after the take? Yeah, I mean, 
I think I've been doing it for such a long time. I mean, I love people. That's mm. it at the end of the day. And people, and because I, I generally have their best interests at heart, that that's the thing. And so generally people trust and that comes yeah. across and then people will open up to me quite a lot, which is obviously in investigations as well, but mm. or in, the, in, in this stuff. But yeah, no, I, I had the camera on me, but we were just chatting and I was like, ah, roll. I was like, amazing, he's singing. And I've been singing his own song but it was it was such a beautiful yeah because you, you picked a subject where it's very visual anyway because yeah. it, it has artwork to show which you know it just, just covers some of the pictures some of the b-roll it just i just say it comes together nat naturally all together doesn't it and then you have the music <laughs> what more could you want i know and exactly i mean that's why it just it just when when i heard that record and the title i was like that's it's just made it just made me go cold because it's just such a yeah, beautiful piece. And the other, the other thing to that as well, actually, is for not just for a record, as for it's the big issue I think you're working for. It was also the fact it's, it's a family record too, isn't it, for posterity? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. quite an important thing, not just black and white pictures in the loft. It's actually kind of there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, easy, yeah. To get, yeah easy to get yeah, hold exactly. of. Yeah, no, it was, it was a lovely yeah. to do. So, yeah, and, and that's what I like. I probably potentially like to do more of is just more that kind of people are stories and I think personally ordinary people have fa the most fascinating stories and that's what I think I'd like to go on and do is just have those amazing ordinary conversations but not because pe everyone has amazing stories everyone and uh, uh, yeah and is there any any updates on on the auction or has that all been on hold do you know with the artwork uh I think that was sold uh oh, okay. I don't remember how much Brilliant. more it, went, it was last year, that one, so in 2019, and it was a big right. issue cover. Um, right. Yeah, so obviously this year, everything's gone a bit... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. nothing. I mean, the company that I set up a few years ago is registered at the moment, so yeah. Cool. Oh, well, we're we'll trying to find out how much you raised. But yeah, it's yeah. a lovely, it's a lovely film. Well done. That's brilliant. Mm. Right, okay. So we're all back in the room, and um, so let's let's move on. And I know it's this is Graham's Graham's favourite mm. subject: music videos. Mm, love so it. there's a couple of different ways you've made music videos. Now, one of them is or I've never ever heard of in my life: conservation music videos. What the hell is that? I suppose again, I love kids. I don't have any, but I love kids. Um, they're the future, I love their energy, and I wanted, so part of my filmmaking is not me making a film and going well done Sarah, it's the whole process, it's about involving everyone and getting everyone involved in it, so potentially a conservation pop video, what I did in Gabon um, was generally to make awareness, so I, I kind of, I had this X factor with a different audition, um, so I had like the local kind of governors there and at WWF, myself, he was filming it. Um, so I just put adverts around for the musicians, singers, dancers, whoever, just to come to this audition, which was in a little, like a basketball auditorium. And the thing was, I kind of forgot that I was in Africa because in England, you might get a few people turning up. But on this occasion, the whole village and every other village turned up. It was absolutely, <laughs> it was huge. It was absolutely huge, and I was like, mm. because obviously it's just me and my camera, you know, and that's, um, and the other thing, African people are very talented in singing, dancing, and, you know, anything musical, it, it was just the way it was, so it was really hard to kind of choose, so what I wanted to do was for them to make the song, and I wanted it to be with their African, like, their roots, um, with modern intake, uh, whatever, however they felt, so this was quite hard, so, I, I, I like to challenge myself. So once, <laughs> and then I realized obviously everyone was really talented. So then um, I decided to do like an African tribal start with a chorus where all the kids could kind of get involved and then some rap, because a lot of the guys are into rap. Um, the song to start with was about 20 minutes, which I thought was a bit OTT because I was trying to fit everyone in. So we kind of, I think we got it down to about eight or something. But yeah, so what happened there, I just made a pop video that was insane. Don't know what I was doing. It was just me 
um, in a truck, well, three truckloads of kids going to an island. So, because I wanted them in the forest, I wanted them on the beach. I wanted them in an urban ground as well. And I don't. Did, you have, did you have a Did you have a song that you started with yeah, or I not? Remember, oh, it sounds terrible. Well, you can watch this as like this one's. I think this one's on in my music videos. Right. It sounds so terrible, but yes. Yeah, so we made the song in my hut. <laughs> like, right. I oh, so you actually made the song. Yeah, oh, made the song as well. So we got everyone singing. So then I edited the song together. Um, got all the rap. Uh, so once the song was made, we um, then went and filmed it, uh, which was, and it was amazing. And actually, I'm really, I'm actually, that's one of the things I'm actually really proud of. And there was Annie Flore. I think she, I heard a while later, she's like a famous Gabonese singer, and she would play that little video on a warm up to her gigs, which was amazing as an intro. Um, so that was really lovely. So yeah, and I did that a couple of times. I was going to start off a project doing that just as a way of, um, I did it in the Galapagos as well with the kids. So the kids write the song. Um, <laughs> and then you, and yeah, it's all about stop. I mean, it, and, but you, what I was trying to do is bring in their culture or whatever Western culture, mix it all up, allow them to learn. We had a conservation day as well where they learned all about different things and stuff. So yeah, so that was one of my first pop videos. <laughs> But just a really like yeah, I loved it. I did love doing that. It was a special, scary, very scary, but uh, kind of bit off more than I could chew, but it worked. Brilliant! That's amazing. Mm. Amazing. Cool. Okay, so that's I mean that's that's one very unconventional pop video, but you've also done you also did a more conventional. You've done more conventional ones as well, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. Um, tell us, can you tell us the one about um, a quite dark, th well, not a dark theme, but an important theme about violence against women? How did how did that come about, and how yeah. did you film that? So, um, I mean, I've always been massively passionate about music and dance. It's huge in my life. Just love it, um, and just art and visuals. So, with this one, it was uh, a friend of mine who had a track, um, and there was a lot of at that time stuff going on uh, uh, with people that I knew or other stuff that was related. And this track to me just felt like it, I could do something with it. Um, and I've always, I liked the kind of putting a ballerina against kind of quite a dark background. And that was a dichotomy of that kind of film was something beautiful that was trapped and wasn't allowed. Again, <laughs> there's a theme, isn't there? There's a theme running through, something that's trapped cage not allowed to be free not allowed to be themselves so same again um so i just had this idea of a, a ballerina and i just um um around all the the sites of bristol mixed with quite a dark music and this guy's always watching her so that's kind of the the theme and so yeah that's kind of when but she's shut up in a little box she's not allowed and so she tries that that was kind of the idea of it was and in the end he kind of just she kind of snaps her up and takes her and there's a scene where she goes a bit mad um yeah so that was that was that one again and did you did you do any storyboarding or blocking? yeah that one i did quite a lot of storyboarding I did the whole storyboarding for that one right so there's a, a um yeah a couple of cameras on that one and yeah storyboarded the whole lot because it was really important to get the whole visual that i wanted and i just love the contrast of a ballerina against graffiti just i love that and I can't remember where I got that inspiration from. There's quite a lot in New York. I saw these pictures and she's amazing, amazing dancer. And I found all down by the harbour side and just by, uh, there's a beautiful bit with the ballerina shoe and the ass, which was by accident. Oh, I love, that's one of my favourite shots. Just came across those archways and it was just lush to have all, all that. So, I, I mean, I do have a, a passion to make beautiful things as well. <laughs> and how did, and how did you, um... So was the bat? Did the ball? How did the ballerina, you know, dance to the music? Did you have like a tape recorder? Did she yeah. wear headphones or? No, so we just bought a, a, a recorder. Uh, so we just played it or a laptop. I think we just played it on the laptop over and over and over again. And did you need um, any sort of uh, licenses at all from the council or anything? Or I didn't get that. Permissions? I mean, I'm <laughs> naughty in my world, aren't I? You know what I do. So there's me. I just go and do probably isn't. Should have done, but yeah, no. I think I've probably broken a few rules in my time. That could be another one. 
<laughs> and that one, I've seen that one. Is that and that was that shot over a day or how long did it that take was, to shoot? That, that was two days. Two days. Yeah, that was two yeah. days. Yeah. And then how did it how did it end up winning an award then? So unfortunately, what happened was we had all these big plans. He was going to launch his kind of career, have all this big thing, and then he decided he didn't want to do that type of music anymore. Oh which was great. Uh, so it was just entered into, and everyone was like, this video is amazing, Sarah, just enter it into. So I just entered it into a few um, festivals, not really thinking anything of it. And then the one in, and then it won, the one in LA, and then was runner up in the independent, um, London Independent Film Awards as well. So I literally went to Hollywood to pick up my, uh, I had to go just because, I had to go. I mean, it wasn't a huge festival, but it was still big enough that um, I still had to say I flew to Hollywood to pick up an award. So that's what I did. <laughs> but I love it. I love music videos. For me, it's just really expressive. Like when you listen to the song, I do that with every song I hear. I picture a story. I can't help myself. Like if I shut, I'm just always picturing music videos. It's just amazing. I love it. It's just a short, you know, glimpse into something that'd be quite abstract. You think you'll do some more? Yeah, I'd love to at some stage. Cool. Definitely. I mean, I've done a lot of live events and stuff. Yeah let's, talk, yeah, let's talk about those. Yeah, that's a good key in. So, yeah, let's talk about the live events. Yeah. So I've done quite a few um, at uh, Glastonbury and Pilton Party. I do a lot of musicians gigs and I love that. It's uh, such a different kind of buzz um being on stage with musicians and having that kind of live aspect of it um yeah so what else yeah so i have done quite a few festivals quite a few tv gigs that's one yeah, of my favorite videos what about corporate videos oh god a lot, of, a lot of corporate videos i've done that yes yeah, so i worked for a corporate company for about a year or two making a lot of corporate videos so um go outdoors, late, late like, say, so product videos. Um, yeah, which was, I mean, I love everything, actually. Everything's, like, quite interesting, and I just needed a break from my other work, which, again, is hardcore. So what I love about this, it's just, actually, I remember once doing this shoot, and we were in a cottage, and all I was doing was close-ups of, um, late, is it Lakeland? I don't even know what it is. It's a product. All I was doing was close-ups of these products, and after the I think I've just been on a hair. I loved it. Just like the ease of like, the, the, do you know, after you've done quite a hardcore job, yeah. just sort of like I just rolled out of bed and just did close ups of products, which was actually quite Top nice. away. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. But I was like, oh my God, this is so nice. Just like, there's nothing going on. I'm just doing. And it won't kill you. No. <laughs> so yeah. But like music, really live events. Yeah. yeah, quite tough away. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got a bit, a bit of a surprise when you were doing this corporate work, when your boss told you you were going to have to live stream yeah, the largest was... company in the world's so my boss, UK of meeting. My boss, bless him, my boss was lovely. My boss was the biggest salesman ever that knew nothing about film. And so I was kind of running the production side. So what he would do would uh, get the contract and then basically ask me if that's possible. So back in 2011, or was it 2012? I can't remember. Anyway, live streaming wasn't a thing. Like you like to live stream something. You, Yeah, I had no idea. But anyway, so he got off the phone and he basically turned to me and said, uh, so we can live stream Google's annual meeting, can't we, Sarah? And I went, what? <laughs> and it was just like, uh, oh my God. So yeah, I had to kind of learn how to live stream within a month. Um, but like, like I say, you can obviously live stream on your phone now, but back then, which wasn't that long ago, which is so scary the way we just move, we had like these big, like, I think we had two like tower decks, like we needed that much power. Um, obviously the cameras were rigged up to the power and then I had to learn this program and oh my God. But it wouldn't have been too bad if it wasn't Google. It was Google. It was crazy. But he was just, you know, he wouldn't. He'd already got the contract and told them that we could do it. So I had to learn afterwards how to do it. But, uh, <laughs> so that Any hairy great. moments so it all went smoothly? No, there was no very hairy moment just before we, we uh, it, wouldn't, it wasn't running. It went, you know, like it wasn't live. It was, nothing was happening. So 
Yeah, that was probably one of the, hilariously, that was probably more nerve wracking than a lot of the investigations I've done. Because I don't know why, but that was more nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw the film about Steve Jobs and they showed how they cheated before their biggest ever presentation. So if he's allowed to do it, I don't, it's, yeah. it's obviously acceptable. Cool. Cool. Well, we've we've got through most of your career, so I think we we're we're sort of almost coming coming to the now, aren't we? I think. Yeah. Yeah. So when we yeah, so I think we should we're going to I think that you know the thing to sort of talk about now will be about wildlife productions. I think that's sort of that's really exciting, and that's sort of you know one of your current passions now, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So uh, I think it was four years ago um, we set up a investigation company with four, five other women. Um, so again, we do investigative work, documentaries, all sorts of things. Um, but we were quite amazed how quickly, it, I mean, it was a new little thing, but quite amazed how quickly it grew. And at the moment we have like uh, 80 to 90 people globally on our books. So um, researchers, so it's not even though it's a, a women led company, it's not like the 50-50 on our books. It's just the way it happened. We all kind of knew each other from our previous company and uh, decided to have a co-op rather than um, a directorship because actually that meant everyone got more money and same money because we're doing quite dangerous things. But it was just, we didn't want any hierarchy. It was just kind of having a co-op where everyone was treated the same and stuff. So yeah, it was, it's been amazing. So we've done quite a lot of uh, work apart from this year, obviously, because most of our work's abroad. Um, so that's been going really well, and hopefully we'll be making a, another documentary soon. Um, so how does that? How? How? Tell, tell us how. Some, how? A, how a producer would commission you then, or an NGO would commission Wildlife to make make a film, and how it would be coordinated. So there's five of us in the core team. So again, so they're like the directors. So if it comes in, um, we decide. I mean, we've all got certain skill sets what we're good at or certain areas where we're more knowledgeable again countries that we know more about so depending what would happen um we would assess um the whole thing put together a budget and then obviously get in contact with certain teams investigators or however that we think would be good for that job and then take it from there and then put that to the client and see how that went but um yeah there's definitely when you've been doing it a while, different skill sets and who's who's good for what. I mean, personally, I mean, I'm a bit too, what's the word? Say it how it is. If you need someone a bit more diplomatic, that's potentially. <laughs> you said like, one of the other four. Yeah. One of the other four to that, yeah. Yeah, that's so, you know, it's really interesting because you really need to know people's skills, you know, and, and put the right people in the, in the right setting, so. But yeah, unfortunately this year, nothing due to, to COVID. So we'll see how it goes. But and what other, what, other, what other plans have you got when we, life goes a bit back to normal? So um, as in film or other plans? Because one has to make other plans. Well, well, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping you won't leave filmmaking, so. <laughs> but I have, well, yeah. I'm also a yoga teacher, so I'm really passionate about yoga and mental health. So yeah. due to um, this, I'm actually setting up a yoga studio. Bad timing, but I'm setting up my own little yoga studio, Zen garden, treatment room. Which okay. Is, but yeah, I just... Do we, I, get a dis do we get a discount on the first class? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> a little spa. 10% <laughs> off. Yeah, 10% <laughs> But I think you learn a lot about, especially in investigations like mental health, and I see a lot of stuff and everyone you know, suffers to some degree or whatever. So I am passionate about, and that as well, bringing in kind of that uh, to people in that way. But I'll make a lovely film of it when it's done. Right, right. And that, stu that studio is going to be in Bristol. Sorry? That'll be in Bristol, the studio. Yeah, yeah, that will be in Bristol. But yeah, yeah it's just, it, it's just, yeah, with Wildlight, it, it's hard at the moment. To be honest, I mean, someone was asking me, um, because I've trained people in, in, in covert stuff and, and I'm like, I wouldn't even know how to do it in this country these days. I don't even know if I'm supposed to walk out with a mask on or not a mask. Do you know what I mean? So our whole, 
and the whole way of working people are so confused anyway and what you're supposed to be doing not doing where you're going not going in this country let alone going to other countries and so the world's so like topsy-turvy at the moment it is actually quite interesting our whole kind of dynamics on that but so I mean, do you, do you think you can still COVID film? You can still film covertly with COVID. <laughs> yeah, but <It's> ethical. <laughs> but the, the risk is too high. You know, everyone's so aware these days. Everyone's like gonna. Everyone's watching you or watching you to see what you're doing wrong. Or you know, it's like self policing. It's, it's a weird time at the moment. So, like, risk assessment is very high at the moment. It's, yeah. It's not worth it because everyone's totally conscious who's coming into your building, what going into building. Are you gonna like, you know? So it's a completely different world that we live in right now. And I've come away from that side of it anyway, and going more into obviously documentaries will be fine. Going back into that, not stepping away yeah. from the investigation side. Um, but yeah, I literally I don't know. We none of us know. We don't. We just because we don't know day to day. It changes where you can go, where you can't go, what you can do, what you can't do. So. And that's just us living our lives, let alone looking to investigate something. So it's interesting yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Cool. Right. Any any questions from the floor? Can I? Um, I'm butting in again as a visitor. Uh, can I just ask you, Sarah? On your um, the list of uh, accomplishments is animation. Yeah. What sort of animation would that be? So I made um, a couple of animations years ago to do with education, while, um, cyanide and dynamite fishing. So I made a little animation because it's quite hard to, um, what do you call it? It's quite hard to describe what's going on underwater. Oh. Yeah, Sorry, no, it's an animal. It's me, uh, <laughs> distracted. Um, so, so basically, it's quite hard to describe what's going on underwater with cyanide and dynamite fishing. So, animation is just massively important in um, looking at areas where it's really hard to get that footage. So, it's just a really awesome little piece on describing. Like, I just halved the screen, and one side was just flourishing, the other side was obviously getting deader and deader and deader and deader. Um, yeah, so I just made a, a few educational ones. I made a few little corporate ones for businesses. I haven't done much because um, I learned After Effects, but obviously you need to keep it up to, <laughs> to keep. So I made, I made a few and then I didn't touch it for a few years. So I have to relearn the whole thing now. But I think animation is hugely important. I love animation um, to describe a lot of the things that film can't scribe or just to make it a bit subtler. Yeah, true. true. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Pleasure. Uh, we've got a question in the chat box, so I'm not sure whether you can see it or whether you want me to read it out. Let's have a little From Karen. So Karen's asked a question about... Yeah, in the UK, you need to get release forms, absolutely. So, um, again, if it was, no one's face would be shown, depending on what... Hmm, sorry, in the UK, then. Yeah, so basically, with um, investigative stuff, they wouldn't have their face shown anyway. But if they were, then it's the same in the UK, then they would have release forms. So that's all completely legal. But with the investigative stuff, obviously, they didn't have known anyway. So, but then that's all covered. So their faces are covered. Or you either just film, what you get a lot of the time is the, um, the legs or different parts. So, for instance, have there, if I want to approach and film someone I know in a large company fly to be in my... yeah, uh, yeah, there could be some legal repercussions. Um, but again, depending on where you put it and um, how you got the footage, I'm mean, sorry. But... No, that, that should be okay. I mean, that's what we do all the time. Someone's fly tipping, they're fly tipping, they're doing something illegal and you're, and you're, and you're filming that. So that's absolutely fine. 
that's kind of what you're there to do is to is evidence so the potentially what the other thing like what we do is is collate evidence so a lot of the stuff that doesn't go into films um is to change government policy so it doesn't have to go on social media so a lot of the stuff i've filmed hasn't even been released it's just there to change government policy so that's been done a lot as evidence so that's what it's used for is that answer yeah. Okay. Just looking, anyone else? Graham, anything on music videos? Do we answer most of your questions? Yeah, I'd say that as a yes, Graham. Oh, no, David's got one. Uh, go for it, David. Oh, we can't hear you, David. You want about me? No, there's another David. I've got one anyway, if you want one. Okay, <laughs> for it. No, yeah, go for it, David. We'll yeah, I'll fill, the, I'll fill the gap anyway. Yeah, yes. you're quite right. There is a lot of investigative. Whereas camera and tech, uh, cameras and technology got smaller and smaller, it can be a lot more, you say, much more covert and much more uh, easier to get things around. So I, my, when I first started in the in this trade, sort of um, uh, video editing, production stuff like that, early days was with uh, a company of solicitors who did investigative work with. Um, uh, trying to catch people out doing fraudulent claims on benefits and things. Very and some of the images is amazing. <laughs> if only I could show you, but it just goes to show you, it is out there, it's happening. And I mean, I wouldn't want to wish any undercover work for a long length of time on anybody, but uh, what I got at the end of it was to the benefit of somebody or some organization or, you know, to, to, to for justice and something. So it is that the work is out there and yeah, you will find that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just knocking on those right doors, isn't it? Yeah. Take this contact. Yeah, no, it is. No, it is. It's just um, not that I potentially want to, to to carry on doing that. But like you say, it, and it's more evidential based. So it doesn't have to go on social media for that legality. It's taking it to the mm. right person. It depends what you want to do with it, kind of thing, and just getting laws changed because that's a massive part of our company. Um, obviously, I'm a filmmaker, but a lot of the stuff I which I can't show and I probably wouldn't. And like you're talking about copyright, is it was it. It's, it's so hardcore you wouldn't want to see it anyway mm. and it is used for evidence so you get little snippets maybe on the news and they put it up you get those you know under undercover they've done chicken you know where they infiltrate there or whatever but quite a lot of it's just used as as evidence yeah my favorite was uh when they raided the home and the family wasn't there they were on a trip abroad somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and they found videotapes back on the back in the day of yeah. them enjoying themselves on the ferry and waving and laughing to the camera. So it was a dead give, dead giveaway. And yeah, was, yeah. And they were claiming benefits. <laughs> it was crazy. I know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So as long as it's for a good cause, and you know, and mm. you don't need to, you don't have to post it or whatever. Then, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. So you enjoyed it then. I did. I mean, I, I could see it from the point of view where they were doing the uh, covert operations from the cars and, that, and the cameras and on the long end of the lens going in, watching the the, uh, the subject, if you like, going into the stores and even then into the stores and then lifting down, lifting down heavy objects. Yeah. And then putting them into the trolley. And as soon as they got to the exit, it's back with a walking stick. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can imagine the adrenaline rush of actually like stalking your prey almost as if it was yeah. an animal. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's like that. It's like that. I use trackers as well on vehicles and stuff. So then you're like there mapping. Yeah. Like the it's like a PI work, really, isn't it? Yeah. It's, 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 it's plenty out there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, definitely. Cool. Oh, good question, David. Thank you. I'd quite like to ask another question. Yeah, of course, Peter. There's no, no, go for it. Yeah, Sarah, I just wonder whether doing the sort of covert work that you have done. Um, did you ever feel under threat yourself um, from those people you were uh, watching or investigating? Was or were you enough detached from it to not to have to feel that at all? Uh, no, I felt it. I felt it, and it had bad repercussions because you you have to you try not to think of what would happen if they found out what you were doing. You know, um, mm. but it's there, especially on the long ones, and that's why. It has a short life, a shelf life on how long you can do this kind of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the closest I was chased uh, years ago by someone with a machete in Indonesia. 
<laughs> in a, a turtle meat trade and it's it's quite funny you know like these spy films actually it's, it's, it's a bit like a spoof when you've got the like the nice big bike getaway that didn't happen we had like this little tiny wouldn't start kind of <laughs> bike that we're trying to you know get on and put, put away where this guy's got this horrendous bloody machete running after us um, so yeah, there has been a bit of hair raising um, at times. Um, so, and I think when I was younger, that's fine. I had a bit more adrenaline and wanted to to run around the world and do all that crazy stuff. But now I'll leave it to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got eighty people to ask to do it. Yeah, for, exactly. It? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, just put it in the book, though, will you? Yeah, yeah. No, I will. I will. <laughs> I definitely will. Yeah. Yeah, lots of stories. I haven't even scratched the surface. <laughs> Sarah, when you um, were making that Farmageddon, did you by any chance meet any aggression from the people that you were trying to film? Only I remember ITV made such a film. Um, there was a lot of cruelty going on in an abattoir, and people from the abattoir actually came out with clubs and had the cameras not been there, it could have been very nasty, I believe. So I just wondered if, if you were sort of felt safe when making that film, because it's quite a contentious issue, isn't it? Yeah. Um, again, you're always on edge, that's the thing, and you, you never know that that's the thing, and there's only, that's what I, I meant. Um, I, I mean, that one was all right. I've had friends that have, you know, have had close shaves and colleagues that have had a lot close shaves even myself like I just mentioned had a close shave but you don't you know like making you're always on edge you, you can't not be on edge you always you're always adrenaline in you it's always you know you have to be you have to be that kind of alert kind of thing so um uh no I don't I don't suppose I ever felt safe is the answer <laughs> I think if you felt safe, I think you probably would be in danger. Do you know what I mean? You have to have that kind of. Um, yeah. I, I think I think um, girls do tend to have an advantage over fellows. Yeah, they do. They, 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 when when interviewing men, open up to them far more readily. Yeah. And also, actually, that's a very good point because that's potentially why there was a lot of female investigators, and especially in the developing world, is we could get under the radar a lot easier because if you're a western man in a, in a developing world there's a lot more respect towards man they they follow you they look at you they they want to know who you are and there's whereas the women aren't they're just not worried so actually we could get a lot away with a lot more do a lot more because of that and it, and it was true and potentially that's why in a way i mean there's of course you know horses of courses and stuff where obviously there's a lot of men investigating need both but for like you're talking about that playing dumb and we got a lot of away with a lot of stuff because we were women um and that is actually very very true and especially more more in developing countries than the western countries and the western countries a bit more have you, have you ever been unlucky enough to think that you've got the footage and found you hadn't yeah. Oh, we've all been there. Oh we? my god. Oh my god. Horrendous, horrendous, <laughs> horrendous, horrendous moments when, yeah, a couple of times, especially with these things that you know, you think you you go to the toilet, you switch it on, yeah. you go down, and you might sit down awkwardly. Yeah, amazing interview. Like I remember coming out feeling on top of the world, thinking this is incredible. I can't believe they said all that. It's just amazing you know, go to the cafe or whatever to review the footage, because you can just look at it on, and then, yeah, nothing, nothing. It's the most horrendous feeling ever. But, can I yeah, ask a question? Happens a lot, yeah. Yeah, did you have to go under under an alias or have another yeah. identity or a, a false sort of CV yeah. or background? You yeah? Something innocuous, something innocent. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you have to be 90% the truth. Yeah. Like, of what, you know, so you might just change something and a lot of the time it doesn't really matter because if you're door stopping they don't need to know that much information the longer ones is a bit more difficult you know if you change your name and then you don't turn around when someone's calling you which happened to me <laughs> yeah quite a lot you know so you don't you just again you get you get used to it so it has to be like 90 percent the truth philip did you have a question well i was just going to say you like you, you've been all over the world and 
and you know, with this factory farm and the, you know, there's some horrendous things there. Do you think this country could, uh, you know, that the farm in the countryside could? Do you think that could be cleaned up a bit? You know, or absolutely. There's still there's still some mega farms. I mean, we did stop one called Nocturne, which was mm-hmm. up north, which was going to be. Um, how many? That was going to be an 8,000, uh, it was going to be a mega dairy of 8,000 cows um, mm. up north, which we did a campaign and that was stopped back in, I think, 2015. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there, there are, you know, they're not like the US where you have like 36,000 cows in it. I mean, it's horrendous, it's horrendous, yeah. but there are small ones that are a thousand or more and these cows never see the light of day, they're all just shoved in, they never go outside. Yeah. They're just, you know, it's just horrendous. So absolutely. Well, what, I was going to say, I was brought up on a farm in the 50s. My dad was a farmer, you know, and he was, it was, well, he wasn't a factory farmer at all. It was, it was really old fashioned, you know, and people used to, other farms used to take the mickey of him because all his hedges were too high. And, um, you know, and, and he'd, he'd, he'd let just pasture land, you know. Nice. You got all sorts of flowers and everything like that, but I can remember seeing like hares about, arches about, all sorts of animals, and you don't see that now because once he went, it was all uh, growing corn and all that sort of thing, like you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's what happened, yeah. and all the wildlife and the pesticides that goes with it. I think there is yeah. a there is a group, I think, potentially of farmers that are. are donating part of their land back to regenerate the wildlife, the wildflowers. Yeah. Um, I can't remember yeah. what that organization's called, which is really interesting. And hopefully, but absolutely, you know, the UK is as bad as anywhere else, really. I mean, yeah. it's smaller, so you can't have the massive expanse of farms yeah. that, um, that obviously the US does. Um, and they, you know, they compete with the cheap um, milk for the, with the supermarkets. It, it's just crazy, it's just crazy. Yeah. There is a there's a new thing I think in Bristol that I saw. Is it Simply Cow? But they've got like it's from a organic farm up the road, beautiful farm, and it's just like it's a vending machine. But you can go and get your milk, so it's great for non-plastic. You can take bottles up there, and then you can go in 24 hours a day, go and fill up with your milk and whatever. So you're supporting the local farmer. It's only like 15 minutes away or 15 miles away, or whatever. Um, so, I mean, there is positive things happening. I think that's what I yeah. want to highlight are the positive things, you know, more than doom and gloom, just to try and inspire people into just making those little changes or those little shifts that are huge, you know. One thing I, one thing I, uh, I didn't see in the 50s were, were birds of prey. Never saw a buzzard or red kite or anything like that. Now... That same area, I still live around that same area, and you see buzzards about and uh, red kites and things, you know, and obviously something's changed for them to come back. Yeah, 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 definitely. That's interesting. So if you could all unmute yourselves, and then if we can thank Sarah for giving up her time and giving us such a lovely talk. Sarah? Very good. Thank you. Well done, Sarah. Thank you. It's been most enjoyable, Sarah. Bless you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, my lovely. <laughs> okay, thanks, everybody. I'm going to close the meeting now. Lovely to see yeah. you all, and uh, hopefully see you at the okay. next talk. Okay. Bye, Sarah. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.